We're going to start a, a new series this morning for a few weeks. Um, we finished off our uh, study on how to give a defense for um, questions that were asked as uh, from other denominations. Um, and so I wanted to, to do a study of the apostles for a few weeks. And this will be a study of the original 12 apostles and the replacement apostle and the apostle Paul. If you remember, Jesus said in first uh, to Peter in Matthew 16 and 19, Jesus said to Peter that I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And this promise now was not only given to Peter, it was also applicable to the other 11. They were given the power of enforcing what was lawful and what was unlawful to be done in the church of our Lord. And that power was given to them, of course, by Jesus, and it was exercised by all the apostles. And knowing this then, I thought it would be of, of great value for us to, to get to know these men um, as personally as we can. And to begin our study, um, there's five points that I wanted us to consider with the disciples and the apostles. And first, our goal is to learn what the Bible says of these men and the mission that they were on and given. And the second is also to make a personal connection with these men for the simple reason that we're all examples to one another. And we look to one another sometimes for encouragement, uh, if we're struggling. So to look at these men and see what they endured, what they went through, um, will help us. And also to remind ourselves, first of all, that these men weren't scholars, okay? They were not official uh, or synagogue officials. Some were fishermen and one was a tax collector, and most were Galileans. And I put that in there because at that time, um, the populace used to look down on the Galileans um, and the tax collectors, actually. And they were just simply ordinary men. And they were ordinary men, but they were given special duties. Okay, we remind ourselves of that. And they were to take part in the salvation of men and the establishing of the Christian dispensation. Um, to study them then, I thought we first need to ask ourselves, um, what is a disciple? I should have asked that before I put it up. But what's a disciple? is simply a pupil, okay, a learner, but he's also a follower, okay, and an adherent is the word we put in there. Um, the Greek word for disciple, matheitis, is from the root word math, and that indicates thought accompanied by endeavor and character the character of a disciple is summed up in luke chapter 10 in verse 39 the expression sat at jesus's feet and heard his word indicates the true character of a disciple if you recall um martha in luke 39 she had a sister called mary who was seated at the who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word that first sums up what a disciple is 
and understanding now, <coughs> excuse me, what a disciple is, um, we should point out that the New Testament mentions many disciples, many different types of disciples. Jesus' disciples are not the only ones mentioned in the New Testament. There were many. Um, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14. I'll give out a, a couple readings here. Because this lesson, it's, uh, I was trying to think, our, our last lesson, there was opportunity for lots of comments. Um, and this one, I'm trying to lay it out so I can... Um, get you involved and, and putting in your thoughts. Um, so when you have a thought, just put up your hand. Um, but Matthew 9 and verse 14. Um, Phoebe, I'll start with you, please. Okay. Whose disciples do we read there of? Who's disciples? Oh, John. Actually. John, right, Gord. He came to Jesus. Yeah, well, okay, but we were we're looking for whose disciple they were first. Okay, and you're right. We'll get to to that point. But outright, they were John's disciples. And John the Baptist. John, the, right, right. I'm confusing with the apostle. Exactly. And Matthew 22 and verse 16. Annie, when you get that, I'll, I'll get you to read that. Matthew 22 and verse Okay, I should have put verse 15 in there too. I just realized that. Who's in verse 15, please? Okay, Our mind, my mind's working backwards here this morning. So who's mentioned in verse 15? Pharisees. Pharisees. So then... We see that they, the Pharisees had disciples, didn't they? And Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, Annette, do you want to get that, please? Luke chapter 6 and verse 17. Okay, so in that verse, whose disciples do we see? The which court? Okay, I was hit, hitting more Jewish disciples is, is kind of what I was aimed at there. But you're right, they were Jesus' disciples, because it says a large crowd of his, and the verse began with Jesus. But they were Jewish um, disciples and we see um, that there was also another group there with them and they were just simply people from Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. Um, and so John, John chapter 8, I'll go to you Henry in a second, John chapter 8 and verses 31 to 32. Just check, make sure. Oh. Yes. John 8, 31 and 32. 
And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Okay, and so who's Whose disciples? Who are Jesus' disciples? My Who are his? Right. All who were abiding in his word. I kind of separated. Gord was right. Luke 16 and 17 is uh, where Jesus' disciples also but I, I chose to say Jewish disciples because they were making a separation there between the Jews and the Gentiles. But the last group of disciples we see there are all who were abiding in his word. Not just simply, as we'll look later, the apostles. It was all the disciples, all who would abide in, in his word. And I also had, uh, maybe I did, yes, Matthew 28 and 16 speaks of whom there? Matthew 28 and 16. Who's that? Have, have you got that verse, Francis? Matthew 28 and verse 16. Okay, so there, of course, this is Jesus's again, and I put in here his special select body of men um, that Jesus has here. This is in their beginning stages. So, seeing the difference here, the different list of disciples, we're presented with the question at the moment of which ones were given the keys to heaven. Remember, Jesus had told Peter that he was going to give him the keys of the kingdom. And which group of disciples have been given the power of binding and loosing Jesus' commands? And which ones do we follow? We're presented with that thought. And I'm, I'm going to sum up quickly that answer for now. Um, because we're going to look at this a little later on. But I'm going to let three of Jesus' disciples answer that question. In Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Who are we speaking of there? Uh, I guess 10. Okay, so who who was given that power, Gord? It was uh, the ones that he specifically chose. Right. So oh. the, the, the difference between them and other disciples it, were the ones that cho chose to follow Jesus, and then the ones that Jesus chose to right. follow Right, exactly. And, and as I said, we'll get into that deeper. I'm trying to hold us back a little bit while we introduce everyone. Um, but John 17, and I have this on the screen um, to, to be read, or Matthew 10 and verse 40. Uh, Sandra, I'll give that to you, please. Matthew 10, verse 40. Okay, it's not a trick question, but who's Jesus speaking to here? As Gord just mentioned. Right, these are his original 12. Um, and John says in John 17, uh, Jeff, John 17 verses 20 to 
to 21. This is Jesus praying here. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, and that they also may be one in us. That the word the world may believe that you sent me. Okay. And who's Jesus praying about here? Well, he had originally prayed for the twelve. Right. That's why he says, I do not pray for these alone. Right. Right, for all, you're right. But the 12, as I said, they're answering our question of, of, of who we should follow. In Acts 2 and verse 42, um, uh, Gord, I'll give you that, please. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. Okay, and who's who's involved in in this? Who's the multitude? Who's the Christians following? Who are they adhering to? Who's teaching? Right, right. So. Just quickly with those four verses, kind of sums up the answer that we were looking for. Um, these men, okay, were given the right to lay out the framework for the Lord's church and the salvation of all men by, of course, the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at that when they become apostles, because I don't want to jump ahead. These men aren't apostles in the beginning. And to, to, follow the, to follow chronologically the order in which Jesus picked his disciples and the different places that he found them, the four gospel writers all differ on when and where they start with speaking of the disciples. And we're not told how Jesus found most of them. There's no record of how he found them. So we're going to do our best to organize the situation um, for our study. And I wanted us to first go to John's account. In John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We'll be there for a bit. Um, through John's introduction, we see in the beginning of Jesus as the Lamb of God, we see that Andrew, okay, Andrew is one of the least spoken of disciples in the Gospels. But we see he immediately leaves John the Baptist with another one of John's disciples. And we're not told who that is disciple was, but many believe um, that it was John who wrote this gospel because of the, how John words things. Um, but more important though to note is what Jesus asked them when they started to follow them. What did he ask them in verse, uh, wait till I get my verse here. Verse uh, 38, verse 38, we see here that Andrew has left John and started following Jesus. And what does Jesus say to them, to Andrew and, and the other disciple? What's the first thing Jesus says to them when he sees them following him? What do you seek? Right, Cal? What do you seek? The question of Christ to these disciples is certainly more profound than the response that he received from them. Because what, what did they say to him when he said that in verse 38? 
Um, in, in verse... The second half. Yeah. And Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you see? Right. And, and what, what did they say? How did they answer that? Right, right, right. They asked Jesus where he was staying. Um, Christ, they missed the point. Christ was seeking to have them define their goals as new disciples here. And were they looking, though, for a revolutionary leader? Maybe. Was that what they were looking for? Were they looking for an easy life? Um, Jesus was beginning to set forth the kind of commitment um, to him that discipleship demands. And I thought that's certainly a, a sermon thought, an idea of what do you seek? And they were simply replied, where are you staying? Um, and think of what Andrew knew um, in the beginning. This passage records the events here of a week at the beginning of the ministry of our Lord. And on the first day, we see um, John it, the Baptist is testifying to the Jewish leaders. Look down at verse 19 and uh, verse 28. In that passage there, that is what John's doing. And then we go to verse 29, and we read there on the next day, John again is bearing witness again to Jesus right down to verse 34 and then in verse 35 we see there that John now testifies to two of his disciples which were Andrew and, and John if we will and through his testifying of Jesus they became followers of Christ and then as we already saw one of them was Andrew and then, what did Andrew do right away? Verse 41. What do we see Andrew doing? He was kind of his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found a Messiah which has been into the Christ. Okay. Did you read 41 too? Okay, so what did, why did Andrew go to, to Peter? Why did he go to his brother? He found the Christ. Right, he found the Messiah, which was translated um, Christ. So Andrew already knew that, and he went and he found Simon, and he brought him back to meet Jesus. And Jesus now, in John's uh, account, is preparing at this time to leave Judea. And he's on his way up to, to Galilee. And continuing on there, he first, he finds Philip, okay, who then finds his friend Nathaniel. So Philip has gone and found Nathaniel. And from there, Jesus moves now to Canaan, to Cana in Galilee, where you recall he turns water into wine. And we see here, just these first four um, disciples, I believe the, the power of the Lord knowing men's hearts. These men were all good Bible students. Andrew has let us know that. They were waiting in anticipation for the Messiah, meaning that they knew their Old Testament scriptures, and Jesus knew this. And in, in chapter 2 and, and verse 25, of John convinces me of that thought because we read there, speaking of Jesus, um, but Jesus on his part was not trusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And I put that in there because... We're not really told, how did Jesus find Philip? There's, there's no um, account there of him speaking with Philip uh, about the scriptures. He just went and he found Philip. And Philip 
immediately then went to to his uh, to Nathaniel and found him. And we see here, I believe, that Jesus now has begun seeking out those to whom he would use to spread the news of his kingdom and the benefits within that kingdom for mankind. And as we will see, it will involve a series of tests, of challenges, and learning for these men. And the Messiah was prepared for the effort and for the disappointments of being a leader. Um, these men now, in the beginning, have now simply become followers or adherents of Jesus. They're, they simply are disciples. And remember what a disciple was? A disciple is just a pupil and a learner. And with that, we ask, did they know all there was to know about Jesus? Absolutely not. Nathaniel, actually, what did Nathaniel say to Jesus when he, when he first spoke with them? Get right, Gord. How do you know me? He knew nothing of Jesus' omniscient power, did he? He didn't know that. So let's note, though, that these men have heard and read enough of the Old Testament scriptures, though, to cause them to begin to follow the Lord. And one of our early group, um, if you remember, was convinced Jesus was the Messiah that Israel had been waiting for, and that was Andrew. And Andrew immediately told his brother, we have found the Messiah. And so... Our list now of disciples includes Andrew, and then the unknown, which I believe is John, and Simon, and Philip, and Nathaniel. And that was all we get in John's account. And in Mark's account, Jesus here, or John here, speaks of the disciples becoming acquainted with Jesus, and being convinced he was the Messiah. But Mark opens with Jesus leaving Judea after John the Baptist is taken into custody. And that's in verses 14 and 15 in Mark's account. And it's good to point these things out because if we understand and know that each writer in the gospel wrote in different manners, began in different places, each gospel writer didn't have to exactly follow the same order that the other uh, gospel writers found. So there's no contradictions. It's just simply, if I wrote a letter of, of a camping experience, it would certainly be different than what Tammy writes. It's a different mindset. But we would not be contradicting anything in those in those letters and neither do the gospel writers um, but Jesus now in Mark's account has moved already now northward to Galilee and he's already making proclamations of the gospel where now again he meets Simon and Andrew again tending their fishing nets and that's in verse 16 we read that. And roughly now, as I, as I said, to follow it chronologically is, is pretty, dick, pretty tricky, but roughly a few months now has passed since their first acquaintance with Jesus, speaking of Simon and Andrew. They'd heard some of his teaching, of course, but they are about to find out something about Jesus, and that is that he needs help in his kingdom and which would involve them being in verse 17 Jesus said follow me and I will make you become fishers of men they're still disciples okay they're still learners but Jesus now has confronted them with his thought his wish for them 
and that is you to become fishers of men. And I found it interesting, the master teacher, Jesus uses their daily occupation, their daily job to spark a resemblance, okay, in their thoughts. Okay, he wants them to think spiritually. This is what he is doing. He didn't call them his disciples or his apostles. He's telling them they were to be fishers of men. And not long after this, in, in Luke chapter 5, we'll go there in a bit, while Jesus was teaching the crowds from Simon's fishing boat, if you remember, on the lake, when he finished, he told Simon to move out to deeper water and let down his nets. And we know what happened, don't we, in that situation. But here again, Jesus is using the situation at hand to impress upon these men. And in, in verse 10 of, of Luke 5, Jesus said, don't fear, because from now on, you're going to be catchers of men. And so it's the same spark that Jesus has tried to light in his followers ever since that day. That's what he's trying to do. Go ahead. The one thing we can glean from the, the early disciples is they didn't say, well, you know, let me just meditate on that for a couple of days. They immediately left what they were doing. <coughs> they didn't go and probably pack up the boat for another day. They probably, they just, probably just left right there. Right. They didn't say immediately. Yeah. Well, they didn't need any convincing. No. And and that thought's amazing when you think, what did they know of Jesus? They only knew the Old Testament scriptures. They were awaiting the Messiah. Um, but as we read through the New Testament and later on through our study, we find they had a lot of different ideas of, of who they thought Jesus should be. And, and what he really was. Um, but his desire for them is he wants them now to move on from being disciples to fishers of men. That's his wish. And so we see, as Gord just pointed out, Andrew and Peter drop their nets. They're gone. They leave their nets. And the three of them now move down the seashore and they find James and, and his brother John. This is the first time John is mentioned. And Jesus calls them. Okay? And yes, they've heard. Remember now, Jesus has been through Galilee, um, through Judea for a few months. His fame is spreading. Um, everyone knows of him. Everyone is, has heard of his teaching. And so... Obviously, James and John have heard. Maybe, who knows, Andrew and Peter might have been speaking with them because they all work together. But we see that they knew enough that they're ready to follow him and to become fishers of men. And think about this. These men now are, are in the beginning stages of their high calling. Okay, they've heard some of Jesus' teachings. They've read, they've studied what Moses wrote in the law and what the prophets wrote about the Messiah. And they've now moved past that stage of conversion. Okay, now they must learn to be fishers of men. And, and this is really what the Lord expects of all of us, isn't it? To move past that stage. We've been convicted in our hearts. Um, we've been converted. We've got to keep going. We can't stop there. And so we take a look at Luke's account in chapter 3. And Luke's account begins with John preaching again, the call to repentance. And interesting here with John, and we've commented uh, many times on John, but John immediately reprimands King Herod for his evil deeds. 
And so in turn, return for that favor, what's Herod do? Herod locks him up. Herod throws him in prison. And we know the ending of John when he is beheaded. But after this, Luke tells us of Jesus then being taken by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We don't get that recording um, in the other gospel, in John's gospel. But following this then, Luke begins with Jesus returning to Galilee, and by now, many men have heard him. Okay, everybody is hearing of Jesus now. And some already are filled with rage in just that short time. And many, though, now are following him and realizing his wisdom. And as time moves on, we see that Jesus' special select group now is growing. We, we now have, um, was that a bell? Oh. It is close. Is it? We quit a quarter to? We'll finish this slide then. Well, now our number of disciples has grown, and we have six named disciples with the seventh one close at hand. In Luke 5, verse 27 and 28, this is where we read of Matthew, or of Levi, actually, before his name was changed to Matthew. But Luke says, after that, Jesus went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And right away, what do we see with Levi? Levi leaves immediately, leaves everything behind, gets up, and follows Jesus. And Luke here is telling us of Jesus finding Matthew, the tax collector, or the publican, as we know the name. That was the name that was used by his countrymen because he was a social outcast. But Jesus showed us that his purpose was to save all men. And Jesus didn't look upon the outward appearance, but he looks at the genuine character of a man which he saw in Matthew. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend.